Um, so thanks so much for coming today. My name is Nikki Waremeister, and I'm a librarian in the Art, Music, and Recreation Department at the main library here up on the fourth floor. Come uh, make a visit. It is my pleasure to present today's program with artist Tom Marioni and guest speaker Mark Van Proyen. Tom is the founder of the Museum of Conceptual Art from 1970 until 1984. Vision Magazine, in conjunction with Crown Point Press, from the years 1975 through 1981, and the Art Orchestra, which had an event in 1990, culminating the event in 1997. He was a Guggenheim Fellow in 1981, and is the creator of the ongoing social artwork, The Art of Drinking Beer with Friends, is the highest form of art. First done at the Oakland Museum in 1970. His work can be found in museum collections throughout the United States and Europe. We will be starting today's program with a filmed interview that was conducted by curator Karen Nelson with Tom as part of a 1999 Meaning and Message ex exhibition at the Oakland Museum. And then following today's video screen, there will be a short Q&A session between Tom and artist writer Mark Van Proyen. We will be concluding today's program by opening it up to the audience for any questions or comments that you all might want to put out there. So thank you and enjoy. Um, but before we begin, last thing, just silence any of your devices before we begin the program. Thanks very much. I'm Karen Nelson. I'm here with Karen Tsuchimoto. And we're filming Tom Marioni for an exhibition called Meaning and Message. Today is August 9, 1999. And I'd like to thank you for agreeing to interview with You're us on, on videotape. One of the things that we'd like to do is just to get to know a little bit more about you and sort of your process of becoming an artist. And I'm wondering what made you become interested in, in art? Hmm. When I was uh, uh, in the sixth grade, um, our class went to the new modern hotel in Cincinnati, Ohio, and there was a, a mural by Miro in this restaurant in this Terrace Plaza Hotel. And um, I saw that and I thought, I want to do that because this guy's really getting away with something. And uh, that was the beginning of um, my, my, that was my first experience with modern art. Great, thank you. Yeah. And then did you study art when you were in college? I went to art school in a museum school in Cincinnati uh, Art Academy. Um, and then I moved to San Francisco in 1959. And um, 10 years later, I found my own style. It took me 10 years to become uh, integrated into this community because it's very, um, very closed. And then was that was that the time in 1969? Was that the time that you'd founded the Museum of the Conceptual Art? That was 1970. Yeah. But in 68, um, I, I got a job as curator of the Richmond Art Center. And that led to me founding my own museum because uh, of my experience as a curator. And uh, I did a lot of adventurous shows at the Richmond Art Center and ended up. Uh, leaving in 1971, after I'd already started the MOCA. Okay. And then it was during the time when you were at the Richmond Art Center that you were making some artworks under the name of Alan Fish? Right. Awesome? There was a, a conflict between being an artist and a curator, so I created a fictitious, fictitious artist, and under the name Alan Fish I did works for three years, including the act of drinking beer with friends as the highest form of art at the Oakland Museum in 1970. And then when, when you founded the Museum of Conceptual Art, what, were, what was your mission or what were the kind of things that you were looking to do uh, with to that museum? It, well, there was no such term as alternative art space in 1970. And it was l later uh, known as an alternative art space. But I, I founded it as an alternative to, the, to what already existed. There was no uh, situation for me or my friends uh, to show this experimental new art, which was a kind of process art, performance art, uh, you know, 
all, all the kinds of things that conceptual artists do, which are outside of painting and sculpture. Could you give us a definition of conceptual art? Uh, my definition of conceptual art, idea-oriented situations not directed at the production of static objects. That was my definition in 1970. And um, idea-oriented situations, well, that's that's obvious, but situations means outside of static art. It could mean running for political office as, as an art project, you know. And today I define conceptual art as uh, um, an artist not locked into any one medium or not defined by a medium the way a ceramic artist is, a painter is. Most artists are defined by the medium they work in. Conceptual artist is free to work in any, any medium or any material. So he's, they, they start with an idea and then realize the idea in whatever is the appropriate best medium for the, for the idea. So it's, it's idea art, basically. And not directed at the production of static objects means not making things as ends in themselves. So, in other words, conceptual artists can, can uh, work with objects, but uh, many times they're found objects, or sometimes it's an object that has a history. So if I drink beer with my friends as an art event, the empty bottles afterwards sometimes are saved on a shelf, and that becomes an object with a history. So it's not an object that I fabricated, but it's, then it becomes a, an object of art uh, that um, was used in, a, a, had a use, in other words. Is it, is it like a, a document then of the performance? I mean, it, is, that, is it important that there be things at the end? Well, I used or? to call it things like that relics. Um, I grew up as a Catholic, and the idea of a, of a relic is like a, a piece of a piece of something, an actual piece of something. You know, yes, the the, the piece that you mentioned, the artist studio, um, in 1973, uh, uh, after after I was no longer Alan Fish, because I didn't have to be Alan Fish after I left the Richmond Art Center, and I was no longer a, a curator. In other words, a, a curator working for somebody else. I was a kind of an artist curator running my own situation. And the Museum of Conceptual Art, I didn't consider the art that the art by other artists that other artists did there as my art. But I considered the social activities like drinking beer with friends, and and the idea of the museum as my art, because the the museum had its own. It's like a specialized sculpture action museum. And it, it was uh, it had its own unique um, philosophy. So in 1973, and on other occasions, I sometimes organized shows. And since I was the director, I, I would not usually put myself in the same shows, except when I was doing it as Alan Fish. In this case, I invited one of, of nine artists, who was a craftsman friend of mine, to create a work that would be seen as his work. But would, in reality, it was my, my work, because I was the architect of it, or the author of it and he executed the work. And so he, um, in, the, in the old, one old back room of MOCA, um, he spent the evening in the show called All Night Sculptures, where all the artists did works that existed for that nighttime viewing time from sunset to sunrise the next day. Um, and back on the old workbench, was, which was there before I moved into the museum, the old workbench was there when it was a printing company for 50 years before I moved in. So I was the second tenant in the space. I more or less left the space the way I found it, and, uh, and, and, and different artists added to the history of the space by leaving some kind of residue behind, which then became part of the permanent collection in the museum. So everything about the museum was unique in that the collection was even um, made up of relics and residues, you know, and records. Anyway, this, this show, um, this uh, craftsman, Frank Humans, made a, a mold from a, a woman, mo a model, uh, it took all night to do it, first her back and then her front, and then he made a casting of it in plaster. And so the whole back room turned into what looked like the traditional artist studio. Um, and then the bust was placed on the, uh, on the bench with the shelves behind it, as, as you'll see it in the Oakland Museum. And um, it stayed there for um, ten, 10 years, uh, about, and then it was shown in uh, 100 Years of California Sculpture at the Oakland Museum sometime in the early 80s. So then I, in the early 80s, I took it from um, my Museum of Conceptual Art and um, exhibited it in the 100 Years of California Sculpture at the Oakland Museum. And in a room that you, you built, um, which uh, was the same dimensions of my room, but it didn't have the, uh, all of the same uh, 
uh, walls. I didn't try to create any faux finishes or anything. I just installed the 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 object, uh, the the shelf with the uh, with the plaster bust, in in a in a space that was the same dimensions as the uh, as the one in Mocha. So it it what the idea was that uh, it create it was it created the mood of the artist of the classic artist studio. So it was like the classic artist studio brought up to date and made into a an installation piece. And so it didn't bother you then from this to change it from one environment to another. That that seemed like it was a. Well, I I, I knew someday that uh, the building the, the building the condemned building that that I was in would okay. be torn down, and and I knew that I would take that piece with me, you know, out out of the space. But for the time being, it was part of the permanent collection of of the Museum of Conceptual Art. The other piece that we have in the Meaning and Message show is the one called Tree, Drawing a Line as Far as I Can Reach. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the mm -hmm. making of that piece. Right, the Drawing a Line as Far as I Can Reach from 1972 was done at the Reese Pally Gallery in San Francisco in a solo show I had where I lived in the gallery for one week and I made works, mostly drawings, based on the, on the definition of the creation of the world in, as it is in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the first page. And in the Bible it says that God created different things on different days. So on the days that it said he made uh, uh, light and then uh, vegetation and then uh, trees and birds and, and water and then Adam and Eve, like that, in that more or less in the correct order according to evolution, um, the, the day that uh, the, the Sunday was a uh, I was in the gallery in darkness. Monday, I had my first and only LSD experience, so I could see light in a new in a new way while I was living in the gallery. And then on uh, um, Tuesday, which would have been the third day, um, is when I used used up a pencil that was made from a tree to make a picture of a tree. And I didn't make a picture of a tree necessarily the way a tree looks. I imitated the way a tree grows. So in a way, I was like doing yoga and. Um, making a drawing at the same time because it's about the measurement of my reach. So it's like a stretching exercise that makes a drawing at the same time. So as I drew the line from, from the bottom to the top uh, in sitting on the floor uh, with the paper below to the floor, it was brown wrapping paper, I kept resharpening the pencil until I made many thousands of lines until I used up the entire pencil. So there's one whole pencil used to make that, that drawing. So that drawing uh, suggests a tree, but it's not a pictorial tree in that it wasn't consciously, I wasn't consciously ma making a picture of a tree. I was, I was making a, um, a, a record, maybe a record of how a tree grows. Uh, then, then on the day that uh, the, there, were, there were birds, I, I did a piece called Running and Jumping uh, While Trying to Fly. I'm not sure that's the correct title, but it's, a, it's something like that. And I ran uh, across the gallery with another piece of brown wrapping paper that was ver horizontal on the wall instead of vertical. It was high up on the wall, and I ran and around the gallery in the, kind of in a circle, and every time I approached the paper, I, I leapt like I was jumping over a, a table or something and drew a line. And so this became a record of flight. So it, it, I was recording my attempt at flight by making a mark every time I leapt through the air. And in the end, I had a drawing that, which resembled the wing of a bird. So, and again, it was not a pictorial, a picture of a bird, but uh, it ended up resembling a bird because of its, uh, because the action uh, imitated the flight of a bird. And then, um, and then I did, um, um, Alan Fish drinks, steam beer. I did a, a, a commercial for the Anchor Steam Beer Company on the day there were fishes. And uh, Fritz Maytag of the Anchor Beer Company heard about it. And on the last day, the day that uh, the Bible said uh, God rested, uh, that was the day of celebration. And that's when um, and Fritz Maytag showed up with seven cases of Anchor Steam Beer uh, for, the, for the reception uh, at the end of the week. And um, and I lived in a, in a room in the gallery that I would sleep in during the day and then make the works in the gallery. So in a way that was like um, 
it was like performance pieces uh, that wh whoever happened to be in the gallery at the time could see me making the line drawing or the jumping drawing or the other works. So. When uh, I was reading a little about piece, I think you wrote a commentary, made a comment that it was a very important period and you learned some important things. I don't, I don't know if you call that. Hmm. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, what I learned, um, it's been so long, I, I, what I learned about that piece, the, um, the creation, a seven day performance it was called, 1972, uh, it was the beginning of uh, my process drawings and I, I uh, after that, um, in that same year I made, I started making drum brush drawings which were also imitating the flight of birds in the way birds fly and not how a bird looks. And coincidentally, they end up looking like birds or shadows of birds. And I started doing these uh, drum brush drawings. Again, these were like um, tracings from um, rubbings with brushes like jazz drummers use, steel wire brushes. So I would do kind of a, uh, it was trance, trance drumming really. Starting in 72, I still do them today, but not, not as often. I used to do them every morning, just like somebody would do exercising and um, that that ended up being very important to my work this um, drumming drawing because it it's represents um, uh, images that I use in my work a lot are trees and birds but they're not um, picture pictorial trees and birds but they are at their roots about flying and, and growing so the drum brush drawings then were inspired by the automatic writings of the Surrealists. So they were not consciously pictorial, but they ended up making a pictorial record of the sound activity. And they, they were um, maybe too complicated for me to go into now because they have many, over the years I learned many things about them, like um, they changed only slightly the way handwriting changes in, as personality changes and things like that. Now you asked me about um, any any kind of Asian influence in my work, and uh, there definitely is. I think it's impossible not to have an Asian influence and live in California. One of the things that I found since I moved here from the Midwest was that um, that there is an equal in San Francisco anyway, an equal a European and Asian influence in in the culture, unlike New York. And one of the things that I think in people in many people in New York think is that um, California art is um, soft and weak because they don't understand the Asian influence in California art and in Los Angeles a lot of artists use light because it's you know it's a lot of sunshine and and uh, light has become the subject of California art which is never never talked about in, in the East Coast so it's more like an Italian thing in a way the Italians uh, understand California art very well and um, and as far as the Zen influence, um, I, I never uh, um, read any books on Zen. And I don't really know anything about about Zen. But I was having a conversation recently with some friends, and um, and they were talking about Zen art and how there's some of that in some of the things I've done. And I and I said I didn't know anything about Zen. And um, and then, uh, then, they, then we were talking about poetry, and I said, well, there once was a man from Nantucket, and you know the rest. <laughs> and that other guy said, that's Zen. So now I know what Zen is. So anyway, I made um, a lot of drawings that are uh, influenced by calligraphy, by Chinese calligraphy. My drawing a line as far as I can reach, it means stick in Chinese, so it's actually a word, you know. Uh, and in the 80s, I, I, did, I did take lessons from a Chinese teacher and, and learned to write some Chinese characters. And I started using a feather to write uh, some Chinese characters that I was interested in writing, like the word heart or art, or to speak, certain words that I liked that looked like what they said. And um, in a way, it's like the, um, the drum brushes or musicians' tools that I make a picture with. The feather is a, traditionally a writer's tool that I make pictures with, and I call it feather writing because I use the back side of the feather, the soft side of the feather. 
Um, and that's what I did in the 80s. So I'm, I'm as much a graphic artist as I am a sculptor. But I, I see the world as, as a sculptor, from the point of view of a sculptor. And uh, being a conceptual artist just, just means that I, um, um, that I approach it from a sculptor's, sculptor's point of view, which I think most conceptual artists come from sculpture rather than painting or other disciplines. There, there are certain mediums that have become standard conceptual art, artist mediums, uh, and they include uh, video, uh, performance, language, art, uh, systems art, like Saul LeWitt, language art, like Lawrence Wiener, um, and um, action, action art, art, which is experiential, like performance art. And performance art, which I've, I don't do very much anymore, but I did in the 70s a lot. I was known as a performance artist in those days, um, is um, different from theater because the artist is um, not playing a role the artist is being himself. Uh, the artist is manipulating material, not, not the audience, as it is in theater. Um, and th the action is directed at the material the artist is manipulating, rather that at the, than at the audience, like it is in theater. So the, in, in the case of performance art, in its pure form, which I consider I'm part of the first generation performance artist who, who used it as a, as a kind of sculptural, in a sculptural way, um, is is a, more like a, um, a demonstration or a ritual than a, than a um, acting out of something. So, and it's not about storytelling or illusion, which are traditional theater uh, ideas. So I make an action which may sometimes produces a sound. I was also known as a sound artist, like the drumming pieces where I'm making a picture and, and, and a sound, a kind of marriage of art and music at the same time. Um, and so that's, that's also in a way related to calligraphy. In 1969, I made a work called One Second Sculpture, where I threw up in the air the inside of a metal tape measure. And it uh, was very prophetic for me because it included many of the elements that I used in my work after that, because it was a, um, a sculpture that performed itself that made a sound that existed for a period of time, one second, and, and then made a calligraphic drawing in space while it was opening up itself. Well, in uh, 1979 I wrote a manifesto about this idea, and I, one of the things I said was that uh, uh, ten years ago it was important to make a break from the object, and now some, of art, some artists in my generation have returned to the object not as an end in itself, but as a material to explain a function, like the empty beer bottle does. Well, I, I think I, I organized the first, some of the first, maybe the first, conceptual art shows in the Bay Area at the Richmond Art Center. Uh, the first serious show I did there was uh, 1969, was called Invisible Painting and Sculpture. And then I, I, I did another show that same year called The Return of Abstract Expressionism, and this was, instead of a painting show, it was a sculpture show about uh, earth art, process art, and, um, and anti-form sculpture. And um, this show was about um, uh, materials in, in a natural state and the process, process of changing materials uh, in the gallery. And um, I did uh, California Girls, uh, 1971, uh, which was uh, one of the first feminist art shows in the country. Um, color is subject matter in sculpture, sculpture about color. And then at the, and then, uh, at, the at MOCA, which is my Museum of Conceptual Art, I did all theme, mostly theme shows, very few solo shows, except for Dennis Oppenheim, T Terry Fox, and Vito Conchi, but I did many um, group shows with it where artists were seen for the first time in the Bay Area, like, um, like Vito Conchi, for instance. And um, um, I did uh, Sound Sculpture As, which was the first, the first show, well, the second show, one of the first shows in, at MOCA, 
where artists made uh, made uh, actions that produced sounds, and then that that uh, was one of the first sound art shows anywhere, maybe the first one, and it became a a, a movement um, sound art that's returned now in the '90s. Uh, a lot of sound artists now doing things like like um, sound as material, sound as for its, for its own sake, you know, like art for art's sake, you know, sound for sound's sake. You know. When when uh, people um, most most people when they go to look at art they, they want to be led by the hand and many many times people say well if you don't explain your work to, to me how am I supposed to know what it what it's all about how am I supposed to know what it means and I say well there are clues there it's a mystery and I'm giving you some clues and if you think about it a minute uh, maybe you can figure it out from the clues and um, and I shoot for the mood and and if somebody gets the mood then I figure they got most of it. Yeah. Nice, nice way to put it. Mm. Well, when you go, when when somebody goes to the to the opera, and they don't speak Italian, and it's an Italian opera, they can enjoy the opera, but they don't they don't get as much from it as somebody who knows what the words are that they're singing. You know, and it's it's like that in in, in everything. When I look through a microscope, I see an abstract expressionist painting, but maybe the scientist sees a cure for cancer. So sometimes when people go into a gallery and they look at art, they don't know what they're looking at. They, they, might, they might dismiss it because they can, they can say there's nothing there. Um, so when they come to look at my work, it's, it's the same problem, you know. People look at Jackson Pollock's paintings, uh, they, don't, they don't know, maybe they don't know the whole process. Of it, so they don't get as much from it. You know, the more you know, the more you get. The reason, the reason for this artist studio piece to be displayed the way it is, is, um, is the reason it has a room around it is so that I can have control over its over its mood uh, and lighting. Uh, so, and I, I, I've made you might say I made a a piece of static sculpture, but then I've I've designed the, the gallery that it goes in as well. You know. Um, I try to have as much control over how my work is seen as I can, and I think any smart artist does. Even, even Rothko said he wanted his paintings only seen in low light, although they don't always respect his wishes now that he's dead, but um, because he was after a mood as well. Um, Duchamp said that, um, that the artist makes, um, um, the artist makes 50 percent of the work, and then the viewer interprets it and, and completes the work and does the other 50% of the work. Well, the, the, um, the, the, curator's, the curator's job is to interpret the, the, the art f to the public. So the, 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 the artist makes the object and sometimes, but it's the curator in me that wants to over explain my work, uh, sometimes I can remove the mystery from the work by, by, over, by explaining it too much, you know not leaving enough open to interpretation. Nelson Rockefeller said, he was a famous art collector as well, that the nice thing about abstract art is you can see anything you want in it. But that's sometimes a problem because um, many times people see things in the work that the artist doesn't want them to see or doesn't intend for them to see, you know, but you can't control that. You can't control what people are gonna see. So it's a curator's job to, to uh, try to present the work the way the artist intended it. Uh, what is the artist supposed to be doing? Well, I have a definition for art. Art is anything done well, and by well I mean great, like corn on the cob cooked to the moment of perfection. And that's something everybody can understand, I think. So I also think that everybody's a potential artist, but I don't think everybody is an artist. Uh, so if, if, if people do um, whatever they do as though they were an artist, then, uh, then, then they can make art. It doesn't have to be made out of artist materials. Well, I, 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 I've often said that San Francisco is a very closed uh, art, art world, and that's because um, of the, how strong the, uh, the San Francisco Art Institute was uh, back in the 40s and the 50s established it as a, as a second art center even in the 50s, San Francisco after New York, even before LA was an art center. 
And um, <clears throat> so when I, when I moved here, I, I might as well have moved here from, uh, from Europe or Mars, you know, because uh, if, I, if you didn't go to the San Francisco Art Institute, you know, and, and you didn't work in a, in a figurative or a funk, funk figurative style, and, um, and your work didn't have angst to it, then uh, you weren't part of the, the Bay Area style, you know. And uh, it was closed because that's all that uh, the, the support system was interested in uh, back when I first moved here, back in the, in the in, uh, I moved here in 59, so all during the 60s. Uh, there was a kind of like next generation of figurative art. The funk artists were really figurative artists too. And, and so when I started MOCA, it was mostly made up of outsiders like myself, uh, the conceptual artists, but still carrying on the figurative tradition of the Bay Area because performance art was body art, was figurative art, really. It just wasn't, it just wasn't static, you know, and it just wasn't painted or, or, sta or objects, static objects about the figure. And that even went on into the 80s with artists like Mark Pauline, who does robot, robotics things, which is also figurative. So the tradition of figurative art continues today in, in the Bay Area, but um, and and the art institute no longer has its stronghold the way it did in the past because it, it was such a important uh, institute hundred year old institution. So um, I f knew that the only way I could break into the scene here was to start my own scene, and so I started the Museum of Conceptual Art so that I could have, create my own support system. And I started my own art magazine too. It was called Vision in 1975, and uh, produced art journals on uh, California, Eastern Europe, New York. We went to an island in the Pacific and uh, made uh, recordings of artist talks called Word of Mouth. And then uh, another, the fifth issue was called um, Artist Photographs. Every time I, I wished that somebody would an, organize an exhibition that I would be invited to be in, and it never happened, I would do it myself because. I also thought that a lot of people didn't take very much initiative in the Bay Area and many times there would be shows by Bay Area artists that were organized outside of the Bay Area, usually in Minneapolis, you know, like the first Wiley retrospective, the first Tebow retrospective. They weren't even organized here, but they were Bay Area artists. And I can't even think of very many, if any, uh, ex exhibitions of Bay Area artists that were organized here and then to, and sent out to, on, on, you know, to other places. Very few. I can't think of any offhand, but I'm sure there have been some in more recent times. And in the 60s, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art uh, basically only collected Bay Area art. So it was very provincial at that time. So they have many, many works by Hudson, Wiley, Arneson, and, and, that, and the funk artists of the 60s in their collection. Uh, maybe 20, 25 works by each, you know, by, by each of those artists. I mean, 25 each. And um, then, then when we got into the 80s, when, 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 when art became more about money um, the, and the, the museum changed over, then uh, the, just the opposite happened. They only collected art from, from New York and not any Bay Area art. Um, the end of the 60s, uh, I mean, there were like uh, roots to conceptual art, like uh, happenings in the 50s, fluxes in, in the 60s. But happenings were an extension of, uh, really an extension of theater. Fluxus was really an extension of uh, poetry and music. And uh, conceptual art was an extension of sculpture. And uh, at the end of the 60s, um, we were in a, a kind of moral time because of the Vietnam War, uh, the drug culture, that, and, the, and particularly in the, Bay, in the Bay Area, all of these kind of social experiments were happening in the Bay Area, free speech, uh, and so on. Later on, then it became, you know, uh, uh, the gay scene, and then uh, cuisine, uh, and so on. You know, health consciousness. All these things start in the Bay Area, and then they get mar marketed in New York City. And there's a lot of support for a very liberal community here for social experiments, uh, but but not not so much in the art world. The the, the art world is uh, more or less pretty conservative in, in the Bay Area. Whereas the, the rest of the community is, is not, not as conservative. So p artists took, at that time, everywhere in the world, a, a moral and a political stand, an ecological position. The earth artists, you know, uh, Michael Heiser and Christo and everybody. Oppenheim were all doing earth art. And uh, Walter Di Maria, who's from the Bay Area too, uh, like Oppenheim, 
uh, filled a gallery with dirt in, in Germany in 1968 and, and with the message that said, uh, God has given us the earth and we have ignored it. So it was like a, um, a moral and a political uh, reason for making art. It was political art. Good afternoon. My name is Ruth Miller and I am an instructor of humanities courses, oh you're too kind, at Diablo Valley College. I want to transition from that taped, recorded uh, interview to a live exchange with Tom Marioni. I don't think we can have enough opportunities to acknowledge and celebrate artists in our own Bay Area backyard, so I want to thank the library for uh, providing this venue. So to lead that conversation, I also want to invite Mark Van Proyen to the stage. So if Tom and Mark could make their way up to the table while they're doing that, uh, Tom has been introduced, uh, but I'll introduce Mark. Mark Van Proyen, among many other things, is an art writer and critic. He has published in numerous art periodicals, so numerous that I'm going to consult my notes here, um, Art Week, Art in America, Art News, Art Issues, and Square Cylinder. He's also penned dozens of essay contributions for various galleries and institutions. He also is a former professor, uh, long-standing professor, and only recently retired from the school <laughs> formerly known as the San Francisco Art Institute. That's the first time I've said that, and I'm not happy about it. <laughs> That's a subject for perhaps another talk and another day. Um, but for today, it is highly appropriate in any address of Tom Marioni's art, much of which is performative and social, that there be a live component, and in that spirit, Following Mark's conversation with Tom, I'm hoping you all might have some questions or comments of your own. Please welcome Mark Van Proyen in conversation with the artist Tom Marioni. Weekend. I know the weather is not that big a deal, but uh, it could have been, so welcome here. Um, I had a list of questions, there we go, we get some, some volume, uh, that I had written up in my, in my mind in the last couple of days, and uh, pretty much the, the video answered <laughs> most of them. So I'm going to pick up from where the video left off and ask the question about the uh, conservatism of... Um, the Bay Area in relationship to its um, identity or um, you know, history of being a place of social experiment. And so um, I'd like to ask Tom to elaborate a little bit on his uh, remark about the conservatism of the Bay Area art world and maybe speculate as to why it is so conservative. In the, um, in the 60s, there was no... Uh, when it was the avant-garde, there was no pop art in the museum. Later, the Fishers gave pop art to the museum, much later, and minimal art. And then in the 70s, when, when conceptual art was the art, the avant-garde of the time, the, the museum here, only more in the, in the, in the last few years, uh, because conceptual art was an international movement. It was in Japan, it was in Europe, and in, in, in the US mostly. and um, and they had almost no European art, you know, except in the 80s, and they started collecting just the German artists, which was the new wave. And then, um, um, so, for, for instance, uh, the, um, Janis Cornelis and Joseph Beuys and Hans Hacke, the, the major conceptual artists and, and artists of, of, the, of, the, of the late 60s and, and seven, early 70s, only came into this, to our collections here um, in, in more recent times, you know. When I had the show at the Richmond Art Center of Invisible Painting and Sculpture, I got a Larry Bell glass box, which is in the Oakland Museum now, 
It was the first time anybody had seen Larry Bell, and in, 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 that's only Southern California to San Francisco, you know. And um, so the first time Chris Burden was seen anywhere was in, in San Francisco in my, my MOCA, and same with Vito Acconci and uh, Dennis Oppenheim. And, and so it, it was like it was like it was it was provincial, basically, and, and it almost still is, you know. It may be in a different way than it was then, though. Different way, yeah. Oh, yes. Because, it's because the art world is also different, so the provincialism would have to be equally different. Right, right. It's 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 international. I didn't know what international meant when the Yerba Buena Center started. I was on a, on a committee with the Redevelopment Agency to help figure out who was going to design it and everything. And I was excited when they said it's going to be multicultural. I didn't know what multicultural meant. I thought, oh, great, we're going to have Kunsthallers like in Europe, you know. With, uh, but I found out later multicultural meant everybody but Europeans, you know. <laughs> um, and then this goes back to maybe the 50s question. You, 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 at the very beginning of the video, you said something about breaking into the extremely insular Barry art world was not so easy to do um, because you didn't have the, the bona fides of the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, how, what was that really like? What, how, did, how did that manifest itself in your experience? Yeah, it wasn't just the Art Institute, it was also UC Davis. And, and UC Davis, uh, uh, Billy, Bill Wiley was the main, main influence of that. And, and Wiley and his, and his contemporaries he was exactly the same age as me. Um, they uh, were, were um, you know, like when, when the 70s came along and conceptual art came along, which was more or less a, like a, a, a rejection of formalist art, um, that generation felt threatened, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they were uh, kind of even hostile to me. But later, I mean, Hudson Wiley became my best friends later, you know. And you lived up in the same neck of the woods that they did in Marin County. Yes, I did for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and and yeah. Wiley was very in, interested in Duchamp's work, even though he oh, was, absolutely. You know, so there was a absolutely. point of connection for you there. And he was the teacher of Bruce Nauman and Howard Freed, who were two great, really great conceptual artists. Um, and then how did the, uh, the kind of uh, anxieties around the Vietnam War and also the 1968 election, uh, presidential election play into this shift in attitude that you articulated? Um, also in my Invisible show at Richmond Art Center, uh, Wally Hedrick had, at that time was doing a series. He took all of his old paintings and painted them black. And there was a painting in there of him that was like eight feet by 16 feet long, something like that, enormous. And um, you could see the, it was black paint. You could see the brush strokes were done this way when he was on a ladder, you know. Then they went this way and then they went that way because he went like that to, to cover up his whole painting, you know. It was a, it was a, a political, political statement, you know, about, about art. So the Vietnam War and, and the, like I said in the, in the video, and the, um, um, of the drug culture and, uh, and, and anti-materialism of the, because of pop art was all so, so commercial and so much about money and everything that it was a reaction against that. So it goes every other decade where it goes back and forth, you know. Um, but Wally was really the only artist who made a point of doing anti-Vietnam mm -hmm. work. Um, I mean, the black paintings were exhibited at one point where they were, he had a show of them where they were all faced to the wall with their back, turning their back on mm. them, and he had actually he was of, great, yeah. Contemplated, and he also lived up in that neighborhood with. I used oil. to play croquet with him uh, in Forest Knolls yeah, and Forest Knolls, Woodacre, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, um, the right around the mid '70s, there was something called the Manhattanization of San Francisco, which was an initiative that came out of the then Board of Supervisors, and particularly the supervisor named Diane Feinstein, who was our current senior senator. Um, and of course, her husband, um, Richard Blum, the real estate developer. Um, how did the, there was, seems to be that there was a point where San Francisco's identity became shifted away from being a kind of bohemian kind of alternative to Paris to some 
kind of like wannabe Manhattan type civic structure. How did that impact your your it, your process, your procedures of, and processes? Sort of like yuppies came after hippies in, yeah. in the eighties was when when people were were putting a lime in a in their beer and that became like a way the way that the yuppies drank beer and that always irritated me. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, but was kept, you know, it seemed also that conceptual art found an opening at that time because it was reflective of an international movement that was going on in New York and actually also in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, and there was also an, an, an openness to art from other places, whereas previous to about, say, 1973, mm -hmm. you know, the Bay Area was a, you know, very insular place that just happened to have an international identity in part because Art Forum was publishing very briefly from the Bay Area. Yeah, like I said uh, earlier that the, um, it was an art center because of the Richard Diemenkorn's generation. Right. You know, and that was before the, the light artists and the plastic artists in LA came along in the 60s. So in the 50s it was, it was like that. And um, well, in, in a show at the Berkeley Museum, during the time of the Vietnam War, uh, Terry Fox uh, uh, burned a lot of flowers in the in the garden outside the museum uh, as a gesture against the bombing of of Cambodia. You know, mm -hmm. at that time, so that was a, a, a anti-war uh, uh, performance, kind of. You know. and what was the other part of that question? <laughs> um, the interest in in art outside of the Bay Area. Oh, oh yeah. Well, because conceptual art was an international movement, mm -hmm. and and before that, uh, the the art always was centered in a place. You know, like in the nineteen hundred, I mean, it was in Paris. You know, and then after World War II, it's all because of the war, it all shifted to New York. You know, and then then it, then uh, right now, it's hard to say there's a center, but there are other more than one center. Like Berlin, for instance, is, a, mm -hmm. is an art center considered an art center now, you know. But, and there have been different periods when different, different Europeans were, were singled out, like there were the, the Italians, you know, that was the first the Germans and then the Italians. And then, uh, um, so it's like, um, California is always uh, considered, you know, like the, the, famous, the famous poster of, of, the, of, of California is seen from New York, you know, it's like, yeah out there where the cactuses are, like that, you know. The Saul Steinberg poster. Right, the Saul yeah. Steinberg, yeah. Um, do you see, like, a resurgence of conceptual art uh, taking place? I know that, for example, um, this, this summer's documenta, which is the first in many that I haven't been able to see, um, started, you know, opened up with a uh, conceptual curation where instead of having a, an artistic director, they had a chain reaction curation system that tried to reopen up and, and elaborate on traditional major exhibition organization. The collectives. The collectives. Collectives yeah. of collectives, actually, yeah. even. And, and it, it, it's, it was apparently divided up into different collectives. It turns out there were a thousand artists in, in this new documenta. And um, there was a lot of. Um, things like farms and, and social art, like my drinking beer with friends in yeah. a way, you know, a, a kind of social art. So it was, it was like, um, uh, for instance, Bonnie Shirk, who had a uh, place called The Farm here, if right. she was still alive, would, would have been a perfect artist for this year's documenta. You know? yeah. yeah. In other words, documenta is um, essentially Burning Man, but without the fun. Good, good one, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, conceptual art came about in the 70s because the economy was bad. It's like when Carter was president and, and, uh, and the, the economy was bad, then that's when nobody bought art because it didn't have any color, basically, right. you know. And then painting returned at the end of the 70s with all the, the, the artists like Schnabel and his generation, you know. So it goes back and forth like that, you know. Right. Okay, it's uh, maybe you know time to you know ask if anybody in the audience would like to contribute a question to the conversation or a complaint or a complaint. <laughs>
I was just curious if you had any further thoughts about that since you have functioned as both a curator and an artist. And it seemed like uh, the sentiment of a lot of these collectives at Documento was that uh, the curators had undue influence or authority and they wanted art to be um, uh, directly delivered from the artist. I, I'm just wondering if you had anything more to say about that. It's, um it was it was hard to to be recognized. Yeah, I should repeat the, oh, the question. Go because, ahead. <laughs> uh, um, what Ruth was asking was, you know, a follow up on what I said about the Documenta issue um, and how the current Documenta kind of uh, dispensed with the role of the curator or the artistic director and created a situation where artists could deliver their work directly to the audience without curatorial intervention, um, and that. You know, she was wondering if you had thoughts about that. Um, I could do that because I became a, a Alan Fish yeah. for three years. I created a fictitious name to, in order to uh, not be a conflict of, of interest, you know. And when I did the return of abstract expressionism, I put Alan Fish in that show because I needed another work on the floor. There were too many things mm -hmm. up on the wall and it was, you know, basically a, a sculpture show. But, but uh, the, the problem, with, with being a curator, the thing, I got recognized as a curator more than, than, than an artist. So it, it, it hurts somebody when the public wants to know you for one thing. And it turns out in the end, I'm just known for drinking beer with my friends and not all, all these other great works that I've done in my life, you know. But um, that's, that's the way it goes. That's how it happens, you yeah. know. Historical memory is hardly, uh, um, tends to be amnesiac in character. Right, but the, the, the advantage for me was that uh, being a curator um, and hanging shows led me to, to be, make installations it, it, and influenced me hanging shows to, to make installations. Because it allowed, it allowed you to think of the gallery as a kind of, essentially like a, the way that a painter thinks of a stretcher bar. In a, in a larger scale, yeah. Outside the gallery, it reaches outside the gallery, you know. John. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, uh, actually, Lydia, Lydia Moda Vitale at the University of Santa Clara, where uh, Paul Koss was teaching, was inviting conceptual artists there, based a lot on, on Paul Koss's uh, influence and, and sort of guiding her. And so I, the first show, one of the early shows, was me and Terry Fox and Paul Koss at the Santa Clara, Santa Clara Museum. And that was, that was before uh, Paula Anglum. Anyway, Paul Anglum was like um, a, a kind of a, she, she thought internationally, you know, she was French Canadian and she had an apartment in Paris and, and, uh, and, and she pretty much showed artists that other galleries didn't show. And that was like the conceptual artists and also uh, artists like um, um, Jay DeFeo or, or, uh, or, or um, she did an exhibition, I think, in 1983 called Sight Vision, uh -huh. which featured Jay DeFeo, Bruce Connor. Bruce Connor, um, yeah. Artists um, like that. Yeah. The Beat Generation. There were five of them. Beat Generation. Beat Generation right. artists. And she was yeah. more interested in them than she was in the subsequent funk generation. But what's interesting was, I don't know if this was in, by intent or by accident, uh, she kind of established a kind of um, uh, a kind of connection between the beat generation artists and the later conceptual group in terms of their use of found objects right. and reference to poetry. Nobody had really remarked about that before that. Right. She she respected me a lot, but she had no idea what I what I did really. People people would say, "What is Tom Marioni's work all about?" And she'd say, "It's difficult." You know, <laughs> that was her. Well, maybe that's what you know. Maybe that's what it's all about. Yeah, that's what it's all about. But she was a cultural icon. She, anytime somebody new came in, like uh, a, a new curator in town, you know, she would have a, a party in her house to introduce yeah. that person to the co art community, you know. And I don't know that anybody else does that really like she used to do it. Well, maybe they do and we just don't get invited anymore. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can mic the questioners. 
Hi, Tom. In 1976, you and I worked together to produce the tight 13 minutes that featured your work and many of your colleagues. I was wondering if you continued to exhibit that work, and I know it had made the rounds to some of your um, curated exhibitions, and whether that's still in your active um, body of work. That, that, that was, we, uh, you, had, you had organized this thing with the Channel 6, which was early cable TV, and not many people had cable TV at that time. You know, it was in the mid-70s. Mid and it was called a tight 13 minutes, and we're, and we're 13 artists did one minute pieces, included Jim Melcher and, and all my contemporaries here in the Bay Area. And, um, and then um, at that time I was organizing theme shows, you know, on the radio, on KPFA, and, and uh, on, I did one on, the, on, on the, another, a different one on, on KQED. Um, when uh, it was uh, called um, Actions by Sculptors for the Home Audience. It was four different, four different artists. And, and so, but later, I rarely would do things. I did uh, um, a, a motion picture, artist five minute videos, was shown at the De Young Museum a few years ago. And, um, and then the art orchestra was a kind of similar kind of thing, you know. So, that's, but uh, I don't know, I, I can't think of any that I've done in the last couple of years, so. No. It's an interesting question, though, because one of the things that you can track the, the rise of conceptual art is by also the rise and the availability of technological image making and, and distribution. You know, mm -hmm. it seems that, uh, for example, port -a pack video production was made possible only in the very early 70s and even though it was by I guess industry standards very crude mm -hmm. it created the basis for a kind of aesthetic for early video art which always looked like surveillance of something that probably shouldn't have been surveilled um, right yeah well I'm very low tech now because I'm I can't I can't deal with it but in 1970, with, I did with Willoughby Sharp, uh, uh, maybe the first video art show in California called Body Works. And uh, it was shown in Breen's Bar on a, on a borrowed uh, uh, player porta pack that I borrowed from, I think, San Francisco State or something like that. And it was shown on the bar TV. And yeah. that was an example of a video art show in a, in a bar. Yeah. So, Mark, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but it seems like. And Tom, you were working in a certain kind of like fertile ground where that kind of made things happen. And then it gets sort of co-opted into all of a sudden you're part of the mission school or you're part of, you know, a certain movement. And it seems like what you're doing comes first and then they figure it out. But then it feels like, I don't know, my DNA has been rearranged and now I have to think of my, myself as part of a school. And I'm wondering if you had any thoughts about how your work is seen in, in a situation like that? Um, I think my Museum of Conceptual Art was the, um, maybe, the, maybe the first alternative art space, official alternative, uh, alternative art space in the country. 112 Green Street was founded in the fall of 1970, and my MOCA was founded in April of 1970. And the, uh, um, um, art News magazine did a whole thing on alternative art spaces and never even mentioned MOCA in, in the history of, of alternative art spaces because it's we're way out here in California, you know. 3, but there were there were artist-run galleries before that, though. There's, for example, Clifford Stills' students put together something called the Met Art Gallery on Bush Street in the '50s, where they just basically rented a space and showed their work. Oh, oh yeah, there, there was the sixth gallery here, but it was yeah. like a collective, an, an artist, more like an artist workshop or something. There were right. things more like that, but, but they, 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 weren't, they weren't considered uh, alternative art spaces, you know. The thing about MOCA, it was an alternative to what, it was a new art. It was, yeah. it was a space for, for avant-garde art. It wasn't a... Did, a, did MOCA ever get money from the National Endowment of the Arts? I did get uh, uh, four or five. Uh, grants and NEA grants in the 70s. That was for MOCA, not for you as an artist. Right. I got, 
I got two or three for myself as an artist, but in 1980, I got the last one for that, uh, uh, for, for organizing a conference on the island in Pohnpei for, for the Vision Magazine artists' uh, uh, talks. Because that's another thing that feeds into this history of conceptual art is the idea that the National Endowment of the Arts for a number of years was supporting artists run and, and alternative spaces and created a whole separate category to fund them on the grounds that they were showing work that was not commercially mm. viable. And then that was one of the things that came to an abrupt end in the, uh, I guess, that in the 1980s. And Robert Hughes said something like, alternative art spaces were first like, uh, you know, radical spaces, and eventually they, they just became an arm of the government. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Do you remember when you and I met in New Mexico and we did the print project for the, uh, the, the college over there? We helped them raise some money for this. And you're, you're a painter? I'm a painter. My name is Richard Perry. Oh, yes. I've been, I've been to your salon. Once I once. remember. Yes, I remember you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and actually you're the one who uh, sort of introduced me to the, to the whole concept of conceptual art. Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. Thank you for that. So I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that, um, uh, if I understood right, that you weren't being recognized, rather than, you know, for, for lack of a better definition, by the standard museums here in the Bay Area and, and around. So I got the idea from what you were saying that you created the MOCA so that you can develop your, your whole concept of conceptual art. And then through that, it seems like you've really been accepted by all these institutions that at one time uh, didn't take you in. And I just wondered if that was your intention to get into these museums through that, or just to develop your own path and move ahead in that, in that direction? Um, I, I wanted it, I wanted it to, to be legitimate, legitimately a museum, because um, in order to be a museum, you have to have a collection. See, in Europe, they have Kunsthalls, which are like museums, but they don't have any collection. That's the difference, you know? And even when you write the word museum in Chinese, it's three characters. It's, it's a place with many things. That's how you write museum in, in Chinese. So um, it's a, a place with many things. So it's like you have to have a collection. And I was serious that I did have a collection. Artists left residue, and they left uh, elements behind, uh, records, residue, and, and, and relics, like I said in the, in the tape. So that, that made it a museum, technically, as far as I was concerned, you know. Somebody said to me, well, well why, why do you call it a museum? You're just trying to impress your father? And I said, I said no, it's because I'm a museum man, I said, yeah. you know, because I had been a curator, you know. And the thing is, I was a curator, but um, I was an artist first. And sometimes curators become artists, but it was the other way around with me, you know. I was always an artist. And doing, doing, being a curator was just something I d else I did as an artist. Because as you can see from my, from my t interview there, that um, I, uh, I did many, many kinds of, kinds of things. And that's what a conceptual artist is free to do, you know? I, I used to say uh, that a conceptual artist is free to work in any medium except painting. Because painters want to have their cake and eat it too, you know? You want to you have the, the art world and the money and everything, and you want to be a poet at the same time, you know, and a philosopher, you know. You can't, you can't, you can't have it both ways, yeah. And it was the new museum in New York that was the first museum to break that mold. They called themselves a museum and never had a permanent collection, hmm. and, got the, and they got all the funding agencies behind that idea. And then soon that model proliferated elsewhere. Um, Lydia. Tom, I'm curious, what thoughts went into your mind as you were watching yourself 23 years ago discussing your art? Uh, I've seen it a dozen times, so it wasn't like, yes. <laughs> and no new thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Would you change anything you have said before? Oh, oh you know, I, I think that since I'm ahead of my time, it'll see, seem up to date. <laughs> Plus, he looked a lot younger. Than yeah. <laughs> In the back, Mick. Hi, uh, this is a question um, for both of you. Um, I'm, I'm 
getting back to the idea of either residue or relic, what, what do you think um, the influence on conceptual art has on current practices now? Oh, current practices. Is that what he well, said? there's some. Yeah, it's on current practices. Well, we say in the Bay Area or in California. Well, it's it's it, you know I'll go, ahead. You, I'll go ahead. Current practices is such a multi-leveled and you know poly polyvalent thing that you can't pinpoint it enough to say anything about it, which is actually, in my mind, itself a kind of a problem. Um, but one of the things that we notice is that the collectability of certain things has less to do with, it has really to do with the connection they are to kind of, I guess for lack of a less cynical term, investment categories. Um, you know, you can put a, put together a drawing and say this is a by Jean Basquiat and it's worth a hundred thousand dollars, but a drawing of like no um, no artist that nobody's heard of would be worth the same drawing would be worth two hundred dollars. So there's a kind of shall we say labeling fetishism that has kind of a conceptual slant to it. Um, you know, it's it's really not the object; it's the object's reliquary status of being part of something much bigger than itself that um, adds value to it. There's such a thing as neo conceptual art, just like there's neo pop. You know, some people think Jeff Koons is a neo conceptual artist. He's a neo pop artist. He's not yeah. a neo conceptual artist. And 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 in the it returned like in the '90s. It uh, uh, the, it returned as as neo, neo conceptual artists, and and it's like things things come come back, but they come back in a more decorative version. You know, it's like performance art was concrete, like in the '60s and '70s, and then and then by the '80s it became cabaret. You know, so it, and everything like that became theatricalized. You know, yeah. and and just it's like that with every movement. Like uh, impressionism became post impressionism. It became it became more decorative, you know. It's like things become either more decorative or in their in their neo version, you know, well, or, they, or more or more. Theatrical. When they get resuscitated, resuscitated that way, what gets resuscitated often time is the look of the thing without the underlying purpose behind it. Because, right. Uh, right. Um, you know, it's like I tell you know, I used to tell students all the time is you can paint an abstract expressionist style, but you really can't be an abstract expressionist anymore, and because it's impossible to be that. Yeah, it's like 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 in the in the '80s when when artists were um, trying to be conceptual artists and what and they, they were using the same materials but they didn't have a concept. Yeah. It was it, you know it, it it has to be your 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 territory. You know, it's like uh, it's like uh, you know in in the minimal art, uh, Dan Flavin's uh, fluorescent light fixtures. That that's the the subject of, of his art. So nobody else can use fluorescent light fixtures because it, it was it was uh, it was his the, his subject, you know. And then technology, in some ways, further amplifies that because it becomes increasingly about the distributional apparatus that dis that presents the art rather than the thing that's being presented. And you see that, for example, there was a technology art in the uh, maybe six months ago over in the Asian Museum where there were some you know. Korean and Chinese and I think Taiwanese artists that were using technology, but it was all about the thing, the, the mechanism of distribution, not yeah. no discernible significance to the thing that was being distributed. A lot of robot art being done now. Yeah, because it's easy to do to, for some people. Um, other questions? Yeah. You know, one in the back. I came in, I came in late, but do you have, a, are you interested in any artists? currently active, do you find, or can you mention a few artists that you find that are interested to you? I didn't understand. What did he say? He wants to know if you're interested in any contemporary artists, and if so, who? Oh, Maurizio Catalan is a very interesting artist for, to, to me right now. Uh, Anyone more recent? And uh, I, I like uh, uh, Julie Maritou a lot, and uh, Laura Owens. Laura Owens is, is, a, is, a, is a painter that, that does these little girl paintings and blows them up into gigantic scale. It's like it's interesting what happens when you do a little girl painting and you blow it up into a giant scale. 
No, it's a, that's, that's a new idea to me. Any other questions? Lydia, were you raising your hand again? No. I misread your raised hand. I, I'll ask a question again. Um, a, lot, a, a lot of your work involves a combination of structure or ritual or some sort of you know deliberate imposition with chance or uh, improvisation. And I'm just wondering, is that a framework that you consciously use or do you just sort of intuitively gravitate towards that approach? And is, it, is there an influence of jazz in any of that? I, I um, wrote a piece that the art orchestra performed in 97 at the Legion of Honor called the Beer Drinking Sonata for 13 players. And that is influenced by the idea of John Cage's use of chance because the sounds are depending on how much beer is left in the beer bottle when you blow into it, you know, of 13 people, you know. So it's, it's very, uh, very influenced by John Cage. One time John Cage told me that he was popular every other 10 years. So we're talking about how things come and go and, and return, you know, fashions, fashions come and then the next, next decade there's, it goes back to like from representational art to realistic art like that, back and forth. I'm curious, are you working on any new ideas now? Um, I know your problems you're always working on. Right? No, no, that's not true. I, I, only, I only work on old ideas. I don't have any new ideas, really, because uh, right now, uh, the, the, I, me and, and the art world is in a flabby period right now. I don't, I don't see, it's hard to, see really great art being produced right now. It's like, um, I don't think there's any avant-garde anymore. You know, it's just like everything's out there, like giant flea market. Well, one of the things that I noticed about your last exhibition at the Anglo and Trimble Gallery is that you kind of approached your own art as if you were a curator other than yourself, and mm. you self-curated your work into five different subcategories that were Oh. related to each other, but also kind of distinctly different. Oh. So you kind of return yeah. to an old idea that way. I showed old work, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and new work, too. Uh huh. Old and new work, yeah. Well, usually an artist, I don't like to repeat myself, but um, um, there are certain things that, that you get known for that you, you repeat, like I did a whole lot of drum brush drawings. I did a whole lot of drawings aligned as far as I can reach back in the 70s and, and 80s, you know, but now I'm, now I'm just trying to um, uh, make a political statement, you know. Can you explain that? Mm -hmm. Yes. It sh I think I think art should be should be political, but not this kind of political, no. raised fist. You know, I think it should be, uh, you know, sim symbolic and subtle and so on. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, all you have to do is turn on CNN, and you get sucked into a, a vortex of terror. So, so much is called uh, like to me uh, uh, journalism, not art. You know. You know, like trying to cure the ills of the world by tr trying to help out, you know, whatever. Yes. As a person back. So, Tom, I know that Lotus Art Fest is speaking to the Berkeley Art Museum, but and I wonder if that's It's hard to think about that because um, right now there doesn't seem to be a market for, for my art, you know. My last show I sold one work, you know, and that's, um, um, it's, it's like um, when, when I'm dead I don't care what happens because I won't know it, you know. It's like, it, you know, it, it, it'll get either hauled away to the dump or 
my kids will have the burden of figuring out what to, where to store it, you know. <laughs> Well, the, the reason that the Berkeley Museum has my, has my MOCA archives is because um, of Larry, when Larry Rinder was the curator there in, the, in, the, in 1994, I think it was, um, he got somebody, uh, um, a guy named Knifey, has connected to the, to the uh, De Young Museum, um, to come up with the money to, to buy the archive, the MOCA archive, you know. And in the meantime, the Getty Museum was interested in the My Mocha archive. But it turned out that this guy, Knifey, offered more money than the Getty Museum did. So, and I was glad to have it here in the Bay Area rather than in LA, too. You know? yeah. So that's how, that's how it got there. But as far as my own personal art, the, the Smithsonian Institute has, um, um, I have an artist club. And everybody signs the book every week, and it, I've had it, you know, since 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 the you know since the 70s, and uh, but I've only had a, a guest book, you know, for like since 19 uh, maybe 1990, you know. So it's still it's a, a lot of years. So the Smithsonian uh, came and collected all my old guest books that people signed, and they're in the archive of the Smithsonian Institute, and so all my friends' signatures are in the Smithsonian right now. Uh -huh. It's about German art of the time, back in the 70s. There was a huge influence on you, but why, what was it about that art that really kind of stirred you and kind of like you went into that energy? Why? Oh, well, my, my, my biggest influence, well, my bigger, biggest influence are Duchamp and Eve Klein and Joseph Boyce, um, Duchamp. Um, Joseph Boyce was the, the basis of, of the philosophy of my museum of conceptual art. 1965, he did explaining pictures to a dead hare. He had his face covered in, 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 uh, in uh, gold leaf over honey. And, and, and I, I, I and other people consider that to the beginning of the whole idea of sculpture-based performance, where the artist becomes like a sculptor and it's about the action and, and everything, and and and, uh, and, and the, the the idea that you know a dead hair isn't going to explaining pictures to a dead hair is like as, as, as futile as trying to explain it to the public, kind of. I you know, so anyway, when I founded Mocha, it's a sculpture-based um, museum because it, it was it was a museum, basically a performance art space for sculptors. Who made actions? And that philosophy all comes out of just a boy. So that's, that's a, a real German idea to me. The the Joseph, Joseph Boys. Where was what located? Oh, at seventy five uh, Third Third Street. It was upstairs from Breen's Bar, and I used Breen's Bar as a kind of social center, and I did a. No. no, I did video shows there and then a radio show. Yeah. It was told it was torn down in '84. And it's now a giant hotel. Oh no, the hotel's across the street. Oh, okay. Yeah. What happened to the bar for Greens? Um, it, it, it went to Chicago. In San Francisco. Second the, longest. The Greens bar. bar in San Francisco. The actual, the actual bar went to New to Chicago. Yeah. Somebody bought it in Chicago, and it was put in a bar there. And then it was actually big, the second longest bar. They had a big fire, I, I heard, years later. Yeah. 
All right. Well, um, is that is curious? There's, no, there's one more. One more. One more. Just got one more. I, I don't know. I, I can imagine you might not have an answer to this, but um, I was also works of art that you've done. Can you can you take the mask down just to talk? Well, I guess it'd have to be my, the act of drinking beer with friends is the highest form of art, which I've done all over the world, really, you know, over the last 50 years. And uh, for me, it's like, I hope that it's, a, it's something that will be ongoing, because it's about the moment. So when it's, when it's installed, because it has certain elements, you know, like it has a, a yellow light, it has a bar and a refrigerator and jazz music and uh, and a uh, table and chairs and uh, a video of beer filling up. Uh, it has these elements that are basic in, in every, every situation. And um, so I was thinking that, that uh, in the future, um, it'll always be about the present. You know, it won't be dated. It'll never be dated. A little bit like John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. It's always, John Cage is always there. And the, and the sounds of the, of the moment, a hundred years from now, it'll be. It won't be dated. It'll be of the moment. It'll be contemporary all the time, like that. That's what I'm. My, I'm hoping it, it'll work like that. I th well, it's a composition. Drinking beer with friends is a composition, a compositional piece. I think of the. Uh, I have guest bartenders. I think I'm the composer. The bartender is the conductor. And the drinkers are the players, like a symphony. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, folks, I, I think we have to wrap it up here. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to uh, thank both of the presenters here, Mark Van Proyen, Tom Mariano. And <laughs> it's been a real pleasure.